All right, finally made it to day four. And, uh, wow, the defense is rested on uh, day three. And this little thing is uh, getting on my nerves. Uh, the mute button on my TV is blinking. Um, the defense is rested. <laughs> they called, what, three people? The stepdad? The uh, Shaq, Officer Shaq, with the video cam to try to discredit him or make light of him muting his camera or muting the audio on his camera. And you had the doctor who was on all day. Man, that poor guy. I mean, he was on there all day. And it, it, it seemed like at first the defense was making some progress, I, I will say. I mean, they're laying down all of these problems that Corley has. So he says from his evaluation, and keep in mind, he he didn't even have all the information before he interviewed her. A four-hour interview, which did not get videotaped, and, and she, her attorney was there. And, and still, I'm wondering, why didn't they record it? Were they worried that she would it would hurt her watching her physical her reactions to the questions and things like this nature? I don't know. I, like I said, I'm not an attorney. I'm not an expert. I don't know. But I, I would have liked to have seen it. Why didn't they? Inter why didn't? Why wasn't it filmed? They didn't film him interviewing the stepdad. It was just all notes, and well. The attorney was a witness, but still, wouldn't y'all want to have seen that? Yeah, I would have. I would want to have seen her, how she's reacting and talking and her demeanor and, and all of this good stuff. But they went over uh, with the defense on uh, direct, her bipolar depression, hyper depression, talked about her meds, uh, schizophrenia. She'd been hearing voices, right? And, uh, all of this stuff, and uh, here comes the prosecution. Boom. They just start dismantling it. And it, they kind of had me a little bit. Okay, like, okay, maybe, maybe she does have this stuff. And then my conclusion was, if she does, she still needs to go away forever. If, if somebody's going to be blacking out and killing somebody, that, no, she shouldn't walk amongst us. That's just my opinion. So there we are with all of that that they went over. The prosecution came and just started dismantling it, uh, bringing up the video camera from Shaq, bringing up that, okay, because she had claimed that she blacked out from the time she took the dogs out to the time she crawled out of the sewer drainage. And all of a sudden she, what, she has kind of total recall or whatever. Um, I threw in the total recall, by the way. <laughs> but... He's questioning her. I mean, she's asking questions about the 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 gun residue, and and he tell she's asking him, what are they doing, and then he says, well, what hand did you shoot with? And she said this one. So I think that's why the defense had got back up and was trying to get some momentum back because that was just destroying everything. You have got to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, which is hard because this is just the doctor's opinion. The defense has a mountain Everest to climb by trying to prove she's insane, trying to prove putting planting the seed that, that maybe it's the medication. It's everything that she's experienced since she was four years old to the time of the murder. They've established all of this stuff that's happened to her, all of this stuff, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, she's got schizophrenia and she's hearing voices and nobody in the household knows about it. She never told her therapist. She never told the nurse practitioner. But she tells him, oh, and the the testimony from one of her friends that we didn't get to hear we didn't get to hear it and I'm sorry I didn't never see the transcripts and stuff but apparently this this person had testified that yeah Carly told me she heard voices I guess I wanted to know was when did Carly tell her I might have missed it 
I don't know. It's possible. There's a lot. There was a lot of stuff to cover with with the doctor. That when did uh, this this friend say she was hearing voices? Was it was it before she killed her mother, or was it after she killed her mother? Did they talk on the phone? Because apparently she's still in contact with some of her friends, and obviously with the grandparents and with the stepdad. She, they are standing by her side. Uh, they went over mood swings, mood disorders. Um, the defense established with him that she, she's a pleaser. That. Like I said, when when the prosecution came back on, I I think that he did a a great job just plugging holes into all of this. All of this. Because it kind of had me like, whoa, maybe she is suffering from this. And again, I'm going to say she should be locked up if she is suffering from all of this stuff. And it was a list of stuff for such a young person to have. So now... Day four, the prosecution gets a turn at, re, at at calling witnesses. Now I don't know who they're calling, so um, I let it play up until the the um, he brought the jurors in, and then he questioned them if they looked at anything and all that stuff. So now she's fixing to call a witness, and I, I don't know who she she's calling. And uh, I'm wondering if they have their own psychiatrist to counter what he's saying because they usually do and it usually gets juicy like well you know (laughs) like the Johnny Depp trial oh my god those two the battle of the psychiatrist was was epic (laughs) and everybody was glued I know that uh during that trial so I think I've covered about everything that uh they went over uh oh and he didn't and apparently the uh I wanted to hear more of his opinion on the video of her going in and we hearing the gunshots and the uh and on cross he said he didn't see all of it. Now I know when I first saw it I didn't see the part where the mom came in with her. Right, so I had only seen to where she they show her in the kitchen, and then she starts creeping around, and then she goes gets the gun, and boom, you know, so forth. But when I saw the entire video, I think it was on day two, they played it. I, I covered it, day one, two, and three. It, it's it's a lot to cover, eight hour day, guys. Just forgive me, I do can't always remember what when certain things were done, but for the most part. It was different for me. When I saw the video, when they played it in the courtroom of the entirety, when they came home together, and I was like, whoa, it was a different impact than I saw when, without her mom, when I'd never seen her mom, that that, that little bit of a clip. And I was like, I mean, both are disturbing. Don't, don't misunderstand, but good Lord. When I saw her mom, I was like, oh, my God. And then you're knowing what's going to happen. And you're like, oh, good Lord. It was it was on another level. I'm not a doctor. I think he should have he should have seen the whole entirety. Apparently, he didn't see all the text messages for to get context. This is what the cross was pointing out, poking holes in the defense's case on cross-examining the doctor. Um, and then she's saying she was sorry, sorry, sorry when she was in with the... With, uh, the police officer Shaq, uh, this is dismantling the fact that she's saying that she was, uh, she drew a blank. She went blank for an hour or so. I mean, how much did she recall? What is she sorry for? Right? They were talking about that. Uh, did she, and then they covered, did she, did she know right from wrong? And he, the doctor was saying no. Uh, and this kind of stuff. So, and then they talked about the knife. Um, she lied about the knife. Um, but why she took the knife. She told two or three different stories. So I'm thinking um, 
they're they're establishing okay so she can lie and then they talked about her being a pleaser so she's just pleasing people is she just saying these things to to please and tell people what they want to hear um it sounds like to me that she she can be manipulative right this is what i'm getting from the cross with the doctor just plugging the hole and i thought he did a brilliant job by the way i mean it i thought it was good uh but anyway, here is day four. The prosecution's, the, the defense is rested. The prosecution's bringing somebody on. Let's go. Let's get into this because it's a, it looks like a long day. And I'm going to have to split this up, obviously. I'm going to try to split it up into our sections. I mean, it's it might take me a while to get, get through this, but here we go. Olivia Lieber. Olivia Lieber. Olivia Liebert. I don't know what she is. yourself to these men and women. I'm Olivia Lieber. And Olivia, where do you work? Precise Mind. And tell us a little bit about what Precise Mind is. It's an outpatient um, mental health clinic and we do research and um, mental health care for all ages. Just to be clear, you're a little nervous today, right? Yes, yeah, I am. Nervous. Is this your first time to ever testify? Yes. All right. Um, how do you, <clears throat> and what is your role at Precise? I'm a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. And can you kind of tell us a little bit uh, about what that is and what you do? Yeah, um, I got a degree with a master's degree in advanced pr nursing practice. So um, I chose to specialize in <coughs> psychiatric mental health. The nurse practitioner program requires 1,200 hours of clinical practice and we have to do different specialty groups, um, have experience with different specialty groups like <coughs> geriatrics, adolescents, outpatient and inpatient psychiatry. So it's just a specialized nurse practitioner role, provider role. And when did you do that? <clears throat> um, that was two and a half years ago and I graduated in December 2021. And have you been at Precise the whole time since then? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and what is it that you do? Um, I know you told us that you're a nurse practitioner there, but what is it that you actually do like with patients at okay. Precise? We, um, we evaluate them and assess them, and we diagnose and then do medication management. Okay. <clears throat> when you're uh, evaluating them, um, is it important that they provide you accurate information? Oh, yes, very. Um, and why is that? Because we base our diagnosis on that. <clears throat> Do you, uh, did you have the opportunity to have a patient by the name of Carly Gregg? Yes. Um, do you see her in the courtroom? I do. Uh, is she at the defense table? Yes. <clears throat> um, Olivia, I wanna talk to you. Do y'all keep medical records of your treatment that you provide to patients? Yes. And did you do that with Ms. Gregg as well? Mm -hmm. May I practice witness, Ron? Take that off if you need to. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I've been what's been marked previously as State's Exhibit Number 19. Uh, if you could take a minute uh, and look at that and see if you recognize those documents. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yes, these are these are my notes from her visits. And again, why is it important that we have medical records? Well, we can't remember everything that we've done, and um, just to basically keep a treatment plan of what we've seen, what um, we think is going on, and what we need to address, and then the plan that we come up with the patient and, and or parents. Um, do you recall the first time that you met Carly Gregg? Mm -hmm. When was that? That was January 15th, okay. 2024. 
And prior to actually having an appointment with you and you being in the room with her, um, did she also fill out any paperwork or have any testing done? They are required to fill out intake paperwork that have um, a few screenings and just demographic information. Did you have Ms. Gregg do any additional screenings or questionnaires? No. Um, and who has them fill out the, if you'll turn to bait stamps number, uh, it's 757, Olivia, in that. Okay. Um, it, it, I'm looking at something called the cardiac screening questionnaire. Okay. Got it. Um, kind of talk us through what that is and, and who has the patient fill out that form. This is, these are all sent to every patient. It's just like a whole intake packet, basically. Um, if they're a minor, usually the parent does it. And this cardiac screening is mostly for patients that we're going to have on a stimulant or something that could affect their cardiac function. <clears throat> and in your treatment with Ms. Gregg, you didn't really need much from the cardiac? No. Okay. Questionnaire. Uh, I want to take you to, um, looks like there is two pages after that. There is a, an adult ADHD self-report scale checklist. Mm -hmm. um, is that similar in nature in that the patient fills that out before they ever meet with you? Uh-huh. Um, is that something that you review? Yes. Um, I want to talk about just a couple of things on that page. Okay. Uh, Olivia, <clears throat> down in question six, it says, how often do you feel overly active and compelled to do things like you're dri driven by a motor? Mm -hmm. And the response was very often. Right. Um, did you review that when you were making uh, it rendering treatment to Carly? Yes. Um, what about number nine when she said she had difficulty concentrating on what people say sometimes? She said often. Mm hmm. I see that. Okay. Um, and then if you'll turn back to the next page for me, seven. Wait a minute. She has difficulty concentrating on people talking, but she did, she, she did well in school. That's the first thing that popped in my mind, guys, when she just said that. Like, the only time Carly said that she had a problem was the day of the of the the murder. She woke up grumpy. She had problems functioning at school, paying attention, just that one day. But she's telling her she answered that question often. All right, just pointing that out. 60 how often do you have difficulty unwinding or relaxing when you have time by yourself and what did she say rarely um, and what does that mean to you um that this is just normal adolescent behavior we have ups and downs at that age and um, typically you can have a range of energy and and or sleep disturbances throughout that age group throughout life so that just means that she has no trouble unwinding and relaxing, just what it says. And then when you take um, the page before that, when she talks about being overly active and sometimes having concentration problems, um, did you take that to mean the same thing, just a regular teenager that has ups and downs? Once I asked her more about possible ADHD, I, that was ruled out, so yes. Okay. <clears throat> and so this is not your entire treatment of Ms. Gray, oh, right? absolutely not. Um, I'm going to ask you to keep looking. Um, there's something called, Olivia, the modified mini screen. Mm -hmm. um, Got it. On the following pages, it's 761, 762, and 763. Um, what is, if you can tell us, um, those of us that are not in the medical field, what the modified mini screen is? <laughs> um, this is one of the intake screenings that we do just to kind of identify, really to let the patient look at possible symptoms they could be having and then just answer yes or no to those so that we're made aware of them. I usually overlook these before the patient comes in and just to kind of have an idea of what to ask about that I need to you know focus on beforehand. And if <clears throat> the patient responds yes or no you would then ask some kind of follow-up questions. Definitely. When you're meeting with them. Mm -hmm. um, and did you do that specifically with Carly Gregg? Yes. I want to point you to the very last page of that document, um, question number 21. If you could read that for the ladies and gentlemen, what the question is and what Ms. Gregg's response was to that. Have you ever heard things other people couldn't hear, such as voices? And she said no. 
And what date was that, that that was put in your system? Um, January 15th, 24. Oh, 2024. Mm -hmm. So Olivia, you told us a little bit about the, um, and I think that most of us have been to the doctor's office, right? You have to fill out these forms, different different places, different forms. You said you look over those forms. Mm -hmm. And then tell us about what you do kind of when you meet a patient for the very first time. Okay. Um, usually I ask about kind of what brought them here, what their chief complaint is, um, so to say. And then I do a whole mental evaluation, and that includes um, sleeping and eating habits, for her age group, I would ask about um, social stressors, friend groups, if she has a good support system, um, a number of things, just to kind of narrow down what's going on. <clears throat> and I want to talk specifically about Carly Gregg. Mm -hmm. um, when she came in, what were you told was the reason for her visit with you? Um, depression and anxiety, and she had had some social stressors. And what did she describe those social, social stressors to be? Um, we talked about her childhood and kind of having um, not a great relationship with her dad and um, an altercation with her mom recently. I'm going to refer to my notes. Yeah, um, you would take a look at that and then tell us um, <clears throat> once you've had a chance to review that. And that's the note okay. from January the 15th of 2024? Yes. She said that she had started feeling depressed um, since sixth grade and that and then she, the social stressors were her parents and their custody battle. Did she also mention that <clears throat> she had a little sister that had died some years back? Yes. I want to ask you, it says that uh, about midway down, it says she's in the 10th grade at Northwest Rankin and she loves <clears throat> school and is the valedictorian. <clears throat> yes. Uh, how did you get that information? I was mostly asking about school um, in regards to ADHD and ruling that out. And so I asked her how school was, and she said she loved it. She's a great student, and she's a smart girl. Uh, did she tell you that she was the valedictorian? Um, yes. Uh, would it surprise you to learn she wasn't? No. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's see. She talked about, in your notes, it says, um, talking about that she was in therapy previously. Right. What did you learn about the reason that she was in therapy uh, when she was younger? If I understood correctly, um, or remember correctly, it was based on the custody, the divorce court or custody court, court ordering her to go to equine therapy. Uh, and who was that for divorce? If, if you don't know, that's actually... I think it was a custody battle between her dad and her mom. Her biological dad. Right. Okay. Thank you for clearing that up for uh -huh. us. Um, and at some point, down at the end of the uh, note there in your history, it says her mom says that she's been lying and talking to a guy on Snapchat on a burner phone, and she's hiding it from her mom. Mm-hmm. Her mom made her <clears throat> cut him off after they found out she was cutting her thighs and taking sleeping pills. Right. Um, is that something that you remember discussing with Carly and Ashley Smiley that day? Yes. Um, and at any point did Carly say, no, I wasn't taking sleeping pills? Not that I recall. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point after uh, your evaluation with her and, and you're in there on that first day, um, was there discussions about maybe giving her some medicine to try to help with her mm -hmm. issues? Yeah. Uh, tell us about that. Um, first, we talked about counseling, and that was um, definitely recommended. And then we kind of pointed out the priorities and what was getting in the way of her life the most and making um, things most difficult and what was a priority to address. And then we talked about medication options and what to start. And what did you end up starting her on? Zoloft. And do you remember what the milligrams was? 25 okay. milligrams daily. And tell <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen just a little bit about is that a lot of medicine? Is that a little bit of medicine? No, that is, um, that's a starting dose, and I'm usually conservative with my approaches, so that was just a normal starting dose for her age. And is that one of the lowest dosages that you mm -hmm. can actually prescribe? Yes. Um, I want to walk you through, Olivia, uh, on page, I'm looking at page 744, so I want to make sure we're looking at the same thing, under behavioral health history. Which page was it? 744 down at the bottom right. I'm still in your January 15, 2024. Okay. One sec. 
<clears throat> Got it. <clears throat> Down here it says Carly had grown tired of counseling and wanted to stop. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember them talking to you about that? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more? Um, after the equine therapy, she had tried other counselors that she wasn't necessarily happy with and stopped at some point. It actually even says down there, subsequent providers appeared far less impactful as Carly grew disillusioned <clears throat> with the courts. Right. Uh, were those your words or something that they told you? They, these were, this portion was filled out by Ashley. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to take you to the next page where you talk about mental status exam and risk assessment. And okay. if you could tell us um, what that is and what you're looking for. Um, we're really just observing for any, any kind of abnormal behavior or um, things that stand out like memory, attention span, um, they articulate well, um, they're cooperative, and then mood, affect. Um, if their judgment is sound and um, if they have any presence of psychosis, hallucinations, delusions. <clears throat> so I want to walk you through a couple of those for Carly on, on January the 15th. Okay. Um, what did you report uh, her psychomotor behavior to be? Well coordinated, which is normal. What about her speech? Normal rate and volume. Wasn't, she wasn't talking really fast or really loud. <laughs> Um, what about when you go to her uh, about her cognitive abilities on that day? Can you describe for ladies and gentlemen what you said about her attention span and concentration? They were all within normal limits. Um, her orientation to time, place, and person. She was oriented to all. And so what does that mean? That she's aware of where she is, who she is, and the date and time and situation. <clears throat> Uh, what did Carly report regarding her recent memory, her ability to recall things? That it was within normal limits. And what about remote memory? So things that were not happening right at that moment, but kind of in the past. Same. Um, down a little further, you talked about her emotional state. Can you tell us what her mood and uh, effect were? They were during the appointment. She was, it was normal and alert and oriented and appropriate her judgment and insight that day is that something you also took into consideration mm -hmm. and what did you determine to be Carly's uh, judgment and insight within normal limits I want to take you uh, Olivia to uh, there's a section in that assessment about thought processes mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us about um, what you observed and what your records indicate about whether or not Carly was having abnormal or psychotic thoughts on January the 15th, 2024. She denied those. Um, and <clears throat> did she ever tell you that she was having those types of thoughts before January the 15th of 2024? No, she denied hallucinations or delusions. Um, and what Damn. was your diagnosis of Carly from your uh, encounter with her in January 15th of 2024? <clears throat> Adjustment disorder with mixed anxiety and depressed mood and then major depressive disorder, single episode, moderate um, severity. So for those of us that are not in the medical field, mm -hmm. will you break that down for yeah. us and just tell us how... Moderate. She's evaluating Carly as moderate? But keep in mind, guys, all the crap that the the... The doctor said, oh my God, this is pre-murder. That Carly is moderate? All right. And what that means. Sure. Um, an adjustment disorder is um, basically just based on a stressful situation that might have happened that is their reaction to that. So, um pretty common, um, especially in her age group. So, and then I specify, there's a specifier that you can add that says with mixed anxiety or depressed mood. So I added that. And then um, major depressive disorder. Um, and then you can specify single episode or if it's been recurrent and then the severity, um, if it's moderate or severe or minimal. And you put single episode. Can you tell us what you meant by that? Um, just that it wasn't chronic. Um, that I was aware of at that time. Okay. And so, and again, you're just able to render your opinions based off the information provided. Right. Mm -hmm. That's all she can do. 
Does that appear to be, um, I'm sorry, there's actually another page to that. I, I want to talk to you about that before we move on. Okay. Um, it, it talks about your clinical assessment and treatment plan, and we've already talked about what medication you put her on. Right. Um, tell us, there's another paragraph on that page that says SSRI <coughs> uh, slash SNRI slash TCA, and then it talks about patient warned of possible side effects. Can uh -huh. you tell us what that means? This is just a warning for those drug classes that of possible side effects that could happen that I go over with with all my patients. <clears throat> and did you go over those side effects with Carly Gregg? Yes. Um, and one of those side effects is self-harm, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you, what do you tell them, you know, if you're having thoughts of suicide, what do you need to do? Go to the emergency room, call us and stop the um, medication or go to the emergency room if you are afraid that you're going to harm yourself or others. And at any point between January and the next time you saw Carly, did she tell you that she was having any trouble with her medication? No. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about the next time that you had the opportunity to um, provide treatment to Carly. Was that on February the 14th of 2024? Correct. Uh, and the notes I'm looking at say that was a telemed. Right. Um, and it was mom was present. Uh-huh. Uh, so tell ladies and gentlemen, what does that mean, telemed? Um, they, they just have the option to do in-person or a Zoom call for their <laughs> appointment. And what did Carly tell you? There's sort of a history provided by the patient. What did she tell you about uh, the medication she was on at that point? That it had not really had an, an impact on her at that time. And so kind of what was your discussion about? We're on 25 milligrams. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what did you talk to them about? Um, how it's affected them and if they've had any bad side effects and if they have not then and it has not done anything like for her at that point then we usually go up on it. And I want to talk about those side effects because your medical records specifically say the patient denied SI, HI, and AVH. <clears throat> so if you could walk us through what does it mean when it says patient denied SI? Suicidal ideations. And when she denied HI, what is that? Homicidal mean? ideation. Uh, and what about when she denied AVH? Auditory visual hallucinations. So she's denying seeing things that other people don't see and hearing things that other people don't see. Right. <clears throat> um, did she also deny any other side effects from the medication? Right. You did a mental assessment and risk assessment on Miss Gregg again on that day. Mm -hmm. um, can you walk us through um, that day? Was she oriented to time, place, and person? Yes. And did she report having any trouble with recent memory or remote memory? No, not that I saw. <laughs> Down under thought processes, uh, did she report having any abnormal or psychotic thoughts? No. And it, again, on page three um, in the in the records, it talks again about these SSRIs, and, <clears throat> and I think I failed to ask you, Olivia, is uh, Zoloft an SSRI yes. medication? Mm -hmm. What does SSRI mean? Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and that's the drug class for Zoloft, and that just means that it increases the available serotonin in the synaptic. <laughs> and what is serotonin? It is um, a neurotransmitter that most people call the, the happy neurotransmitter, and it affects mood and sleep. So when you put somebody on an SSRI, the, the goal is to try to make them a little bit happier. Right. Mm -hmm. Hence the anti-depression medication is yes. going to help depression. Yes. Uh, and it says that, again, the patient was warned of any side effects. Mm -hmm. uh, do you recall if you specifically went back over that with them? I don't recall. Okay. Um, was that the, um, you had you had a telemed conversation with them, uh, Carly discussed that she didn't feel the medicine was, was really doing anything to her, so you decided to up it to right. 50 milligrams. Mm -hmm. uh, was there an opportunity that you had to see Carly uh, after that? Yes, one more time. One more time. Okay, mm -hmm. and was that in person or was that telemed? That was telemed as well. And the records that I have been provided show that you saw her on March the 12th right. of 2024. That's right. Um, could you tell us about what was relayed to you uh, by Carly uh, on the 12th? Um, she said that the medication was making her feel like a zombie. 
And what was your discussion with them um, uh, once she just once she stated that she kind of felt zombie like? Um, I that's, I never want that for any adolescent. So um, we definitely were not going to increase it, and we just decided to go ahead and switch it to a different medication so that she didn't have that flatness and take away her personality. Well, when you talk about switching the medications, did you tell her to stop taking the Zoloft? Tell us about what your recommendation was. Um, I recommend tapering off so that you don't have any kind of discontinuation syndrome, which is a possibility, um, or rebound symptoms. So I told her to take 25 milligrams of Zoloft for 10 days and um, then stop it, and then start the Lexapro for five milligrams at the same time. <clears throat> I want to back up again. I'm not in the medical field, so I want to make sure that tapering off means the same thing. I think. Okay. So she's on the 50 milligrams, right? And then you want to put her on five milligrams of Lexapro simultaneously as going down on the Zoloft. So the Zoloft, you're saying, like, come down a little bit of this, right. While we're taking this, so uh -huh. that you don't just get off all the medicine, right? Uh huh. Weaning off. <clears throat> and you, you said something about to uh, rebound effects, to prevent rebound effects. What does that mean? If you have a discontinuation syndrome, if you stop your medication abruptly, there's always a risk for symptoms to come back, maybe worse, um, and then other things that just are unco uncomfortable whenever you're withdrawing. And you don't know when you prescribe people medication whether they're adhering to your recommendations or no, not, do you? No. <clears throat> um, at any point during that evaluation with Ms. Gregg, did she report that she was hearing voices? No. Uh, in fact, I think the very last line you said, again, she denies SI, suicidal ideations, mm -hmm. um, that she denied homicidal ideations, is mm -hmm. that right? Right. And that she denied AVH, audio, uh, auditory like visual hallucinations. Uh huh. Um, and you also did. We're probably going to get some questions on why would she deny it if she was having it? Okay, I'm waiting for that to come up, by the way. <sighs> wow. Somebody in the chat wrote, uh, they think that she's just going along with what the uh, the doctor was saying and that it's not helping the, the prosecution, basically, or something to that effect, but I think it is. She is not telling anybody anything. It's only after the fact that all of a sudden now she's, she was hearing voices. She blacked out. She's, you know, she's having these psychotic episodes hurt she smoked some weed and took her meds and then fell on the floor for 20 minutes while her parents weren't home that she it was the worst experience she ever had but she didn't tell nobody i i don't i think this is this is hurting the defense my opinion i'm trying to pay attention this is a lot to go over for some somebody's psychosis and i y'all don't noticed earlier she was smiling at Kyle at Carly. I mean, I'm not saying that she should frown at her, but good God, this this girl murdered her mother. Anyway, I I think it's it's helping the prosecution. A mental status exam and risk assessment of Miss Gregg from that day. Right. Um, and I'm looking at your records, Bates stamps number seven fifty four. <clears throat> um, could you tell us? what your findings were with regards to whether or not Carly Gregg was oriented to time, place, and person. She was still oriented um, within normal limits. So again, she knew where she was, she knew who she was, she knew the time. Correct. Um, her recent memory, what, what did you determine? It was normal. Uh, intact. Any, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry, it was in, it's intact. Um, at any point in, in your providing treatment to Carly Gregg, did she tell you I'm having memory problems? Not that I recall, no. Did she ever tell you about any blackouts, any lapses in time? Never, but that was coming. Uh, you go down and you talk about her judgment on that day. Could you tell us what your findings were with regard to that? Within normal limits. And her thought process rate. Normal rate and rhythm. So if you would, I don't think I'd asked you about that, Olivia, um, before now. I said on her questionnaire there were like some racing thoughts sometimes. R right. Um, but when you observed her, what does her thought process rate was normal and in rhythm mean? 
that it was not racing. And that was the same on all three times that you had come in contact with her? Right. Uh, and then she also, um, you, you, you had questions and, and reported in your records that her, uh, there have been no thoughts of abnormal or psychotic thoughts. Is that correct? Right. So to be clear, at no point in the three times that you treated Carly Gregg did she report hearing voices. Right. Uh, at no point did she report that she was having lapses in memory. Correct. Did she ever use the word uh, derealized? No. She never described herself as feeling derealized? No. Did she ever use the word disassociation? No. Are those words that people typically use when you're treating them as patients? Not typically, no. Uh, those are more like clinical terms. Right. Court's indulgence. Yeah, she would probably say something like, I don't feel things are real. She would, I mean, yeah, those are clinical terms. I wouldn't think a 14-year-old would, would be doing that. But she's, but she's really book smart. I don't know. But she says she didn't say all of this. And I think the prosecution's doing a great job through here by saying, what was she ever disillusional? Did she ever say she had blackouts? <sighs> this is good, good questioning. And I know that uh, the defense is going to get a crack at her, but uh, wow. What is the defense going to come back and say? And guys, this, did she lie? On saying these things, because maybe, maybe she can come up and say, well, do maybe, maybe the defense could say, well, because her mom was sitting there, that maybe she, she would be deceptive and she didn't want her mom to know these things. That's a possibility for the defense to bring that up. I mean, unless she was alone with Carly and the mom was outside. I, I would think, I, we all know, and, and a lot of stuff that's happening today with the... Um, the stupid woke crap where counselors and teachers are talking to these kids and, and telling them it's confidential. I, I would, I'm just assuming that the nurse could say, you know, could she? I, I don't know if that question is going to come up. Was Did she ever say to Carly, hey, you can talk to me? Or did Carly's therapist, because this is a nurse practitioner, and Carly also had a therapist. And the therapist, wouldn't they say, well, this this is confidential. You can talk to me. It, I'm just going to make another point. I don't think they should have ever. Now, it seems to me, if I got this wrong, she saw the nurse practitioner first before she went to therapy, and then they recommended therapy. I, I could be wrong, but this is what my brain is picking up so far. I don't think that they should have prescribed her anything until she had lengthy therapy sessions to talk things out. That's just my opinion, because these medicines can be dangerous. Especially with somebody who's already, for somebody so young, and so far, she hasn't told anybody she's hearing voices. Now, if her mother knew about it, her mother would have told the nurse practitioner, yeah, she's hearing voices, since she was six. So she's already 14, talking to this nurse practitioner. The, she has no idea that, that Carly's hearing voices. But Carly tells this doctor, first time she heard voices, she was six years old. I I'm just, I'm just have questions and, and curious of how this played out. And they, they probably should have never prescribed her medicines until she had a chance to, to go through some kind of therapy. First, talking it out. Finding out more, digging in deeper, instead of just putting her on some dumbass drug. That's my opinion. Because I don't think she was hearing voices. Now that I'm hearing all of this and there'd been no evidence and the mom didn't say anything, they took her because she know the mom knows she's depressed and has anxiety. That's why she's taking her. Not the fact that she shows suicide uh, not suicidal tendencies, but uh, schizophrenic tendencies. Schizophrenic. 
No further questions, John. Oh. Wow. Okay. I thought she asked what she needed to ask. Just chip it away at what the doctor said. Because, man, there is a list of stuff that doctor said that, that she suffered from. And this nurse practitioner was the first to, to you know, evaluate her. And none of this came out. Now, they can only go by what someone tells you. So, Carly, no, I don't have these problems. I don't have this. I don't have that. All right, let's see what the defense is going to say. Let's go. All right, here she is. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How many times did you see Carly from January to March of 2024? Three. Three. And how many of those times were in person? Once. And how many of those three times was Ashley Smiley also present? All three. All three. And was she in, like when you were seeing Carly in person, was she in the room with you guys? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. <clears throat> I knew And <laughs> what, if any, conversations did you have with Miss Smiley during the course of your treatment with Carly? Um, for any minors, we have to get consent for treatment and medications. Um, so I, we talked about the whole treatment plan and what they were okay with and came up with a plan together. Okay. So I'm thinking she says, so how many times did you see her? How many times in person? Once. And the mom was there the whole time. This is what I was just saying a moment ago. I thought the defense was going to use this. Now, what, would it be typical for a teenager to hold back on some of this stuff? <coughs> right? What else is she going to do? Because she's just got to chip away and gain some momentum back from what the prosecution just did on talking to her. But again... The, the prosecution can come back up and say, well, look, your doctor only saw her for four hours. And he's come up with a list of stuff that's wrong with her. <laughs> this, this is getting interesting. Here we go. Is it fair to say that you don't have the same confidentiality between a medical provider and a patient? If that patient's a minor and their parents is in the room, um, we can by law we have to report anything. We cannot tell any anything that they tell us except for if they are a danger to themselves or others. But if the parents in the room with them, oh yes, yeah. So there's really no confidentiality between you and Carly if someone else is in the room with you. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. If a parent is in the room with you, Carly doesn't have confidentiality between you and Carly, right? Because somebody she else. She could have told present. me anything. We could have spoken alone. I, I'm, I gave them the option of that too. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if Carly would have reported to you between January and March that she was having auditory hallucinations, would that have been something you felt like you needed to report to her parent? No. What? You wouldn't have needed to tell her mom that she was not legally, no. Okay. But in your just based on your own personal treatment, would you have felt like you needed to? Personally, yes, probably. Okay. And if you if you knew that Carly had reported to her best friend and in her personal journal that she was hearing voices, would that have changed your diagnosis of Carly? I can only go off of what I assessed at the time. If, if Carly would have told you that she was hearing voices mm -hmm. um, and having these auditory hallucinations, would that have changed your treatment of Carly? Yeah. Would it have? How so? Um, I would have had to roll out. Well, we would, we would have potentially started her on a different medication. And a different how? Um, an antipsychotic is what we used to treat that. Okay. Mm-hmm. And why would you use an antipsychotic in that situation? Because that is that is what hearing voices is. It's psychosis. Okay. And Carly's taking a lot of notes, by the way, guys. Is it fair to say you can be a great medical provider, 
great at your job and doing your very best job, but still miss things sometimes? Sure. Yeah. That's a dumb question. And is it fair to say that if a person is experiencing memory loss, they might not always be aware of it? Possibly. Is it fair to say that if a person has lost time, they might not always be aware of it? Sure. Okay. And I think they would realize it sooner or later. Look at, do you still have your report in front of you? I do. Can you look at page at the bottom, I think it's 742 mm -hmm. in red. And can you look at symptoms? Uh -huh. uh, and the visit date there is January 15th, 2024. Right. And was that the first time you saw Carly yes. and her mom? Uh -huh. And what symptoms were reported at that time? Depression, anxiety, um, cutting, insomnia, overthinking, hopeless, racing thoughts, and stress. <clears throat> and if you will turn to page 745. Okay. And again, this is the, the same visit date, January 15th, 2024. Yeah. Can you read uh, what's written there under family behavioral history for father? It says father, um, manic bipolar, ADHD, drug, alcohol, and prescription abuse. And this was filled out by Ashley. Okay. And is bipolar disorder, based you know, on your knowledge and experience, is bipolar disorder often hereditary? It can be. And can you tell me what's the difference between someone feeling sad and a major depressive disorder? Yeah, um, we all have changes in mood. Sadness um, is considered normal and depressive. a depressive episode or depression, major depression, is something that interferes with their daily life. Okay, so it's affecting how you function. Right. Okay. And if you could, will you turn to page 748 with me? Yeah. Okay. And if you look at the last paragraph on that page, the first sentence, um, and this is, I guess, when you're going over your right. prescription medication, mm -hmm. and again, this is still from January 15th, 2024. Can you tell me what's written there on the sentence that reads, this can lead to? This can lead to increased of thoughts of, thoughts of self-harm. Many psychiatric medications have been shown to possibly worsen the symptoms or cause increased thoughts of self-harm. Please stop the medication and notify the clinic if this occurs and seek help in the emergency department if you do not feel safe. Okay. So it's commonly known in the medical community that sometimes if you put somebody on a, an SSRI, it can worsen the symptoms they're already experiencing. Um, the black box warning is for self-harm and suicidal thoughts, so that is a possibility. What is a black box warning? Um, something for the whole class that's, that's considered serious. Okay, so it's like a warning. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you will, I just have one more question for you. If you can turn to page 753. And this was your March 12th, 2024 visit. Uh huh. And can you read the second sentence on that page? And this was after the telehealth visit with Carly and her mom. It starts with, she said she doesn't like the Zoloft. Right. That it makes her feel like a zombie. So we will wean off of it and switch to Lexapro. And then will you read what patient's mom? The patient's mom declined Prozac as she took it, she herself took it years ago and gave it, it gave her suicidal thoughts. Okay. And is that what Miss Miley reported to you that day? Yes. Thank you. I beg the court's indulgence, Your Honor. I don't think they made any leeway with that questioning. Is it fair to say sometimes patients don't tell you everything you need to know? Oh. Right. Yeah. Does that happen m more so, like not just with children, but with all patients? Well, if they're not telling me, I'm, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But it's fair to say that that happens. Yeah. No, I knew that was coming. I, that was a given that the defense was going to do that. And I'm not the sharpest tool in the shit, but I was thinking, damn, 
they, they got to ask that because she had three sessions, one in person, two via video chat, and the mom was there the whole time. But she did come out and say she offered to talk to Carly alone. Carly said didn't. I don't know if the mom said no. She didn't say that, but she did. She said she gave him the option. I would think. I mean, if it was my kid, and I was like, "Well, yeah, go go talk to him alone. Maybe he doesn't want to say stuff around me," you know. Which I get it because teenagers don't don't you know. Please find out the problem. Go talk to him. If Carly's mom said, well, if Carly wants to, but Carly wasn't making a connection with this young woman. I mean, she is young. She appears to be very young to me. And that Carly's not making connection with her to to feel comfortable with, with, with opening up to her. Because she had, we had already established that Carly wanted to stop the therapy with the therapist. Maybe they needed to get a new therapist. If she wanted to stop the therapist, then that, you know, everybody can talk to other people. And sometimes that's just not the right person. You need to find the therapist you can connect with. Let's see what the redirect's going to be, guys. (coughs) She's getting ping-ponged. Olivia, I think on uh, when Miss Todd was questioning, you said something about that you gave Carly the option to meet with you alone. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, usually I ask right when I go get the patient out of the waiting room, do you want mom to come or do you want to meet first alone? And I don't recall whether she wanted to be alone. If she, would, if she wanted to be alone, I would have seen her alone, of course. And that didn't happen in this case? No. Um, Ms. Todd asked you about if a person was having memory problems, they might not report it. They might not know to report it. Um, right. <clears throat> did Ashley ever report to you that Carly was having memory problems? No. Did Ashley ever report to you that Carly was having disassociation? No. Did she ever report to you that Carly was had, had said that she feels derealized? <laughs> Objection. <laughs> Did Ashley report to you um, that she had ever had homicidal thoughts while she was on Prozac? No. Uh, and I, I wanted, she wasn't on Prozac. Ashley. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Um, the medication, and, and Ms. Todd thankfully had you read that whole thing. It talks about self-harm. Uh-huh. It never says that it can cause homicidal thoughts, right? No. Uh, And in fact, none were ever reported to you in this case. Correct. That's a good point. Ms. Todd asked you about the medical history on page 745 regarding Carly's dad. And I think it was your testimony that Ashley had filled that information in. Right. You did not diagnose Carly's father with having bipolar. No. Um, they do mention, though, that he has a drug, alcohol, and prescription abuse problem, right? Correct. Uh, in your experience and training, Olivia, can people that are on drugs sometimes appear to have bipolar symptoms? Sure. Good point. Uh, sometimes doctors, even though they're really good at their job, they might miss something and misdiagnose someone with bipolar. Duh. Correct. And you yeah. have no way of knowing if Mr. Gregg's diagnosis uh, was actually bipolar, do you? No. And it very well could have been that it was his drug problem. Sure. And so drug problems are also hereditary, weren't they? Yeah. A drug addiction. <clears throat> Can be. I want to take you to page 753. Uh, Ms. Todd asked you some questions about that note. And that was your treatment record from, um, do you, excuse me, February the 14th, I think. Hold on. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. That's a... Uh, March March. the 12th of of 2024. Okay. That very last line, uh, what did you report regarding Carly's sleep habits? She reported good sleep. So March the 12th, 2024, she's telling you that she's sleeping well at night. Right. Again, just to be clear, you can only treat with what you're provided with, the information Mm -hmm. you're provided with. Correct. And you were never told that Carly had any memory lapses. No. Any audio, uh, auditory voices. Right. No, no further questions, Your Honor. 
May this witness be finally excused by the state. Yes, sir. By the defense. Yes, sir. Ready to go. Please leave the exhibit. The state may call its next witness. The state calls Rebecca Kerr. <coughs> Do you think, I don't think the defense had any effect on this witness to help their case. I think, if anything, it helped the prosecution. Establishing. Carly never mentioned none of this stuff. Now, they did get a little smidgen because I knew they were going to say it. Because you weren't alone with her. The mom was there. I think they should have went into more details about that to on the defense's side, by the way. To say, well, hey, you think Carly just didn't come out with all this stuff because she didn't want her mother to know? Now, they did ask her about uh, confidentiality between her and Carly. Like, I guess by saying, well, if she told you all this stuff, you got to tell her mom. And she said no. She said no. If Carly told her, which I think hurt hurt the defense, her asking that. So Carly says, yeah, I'm hearing voices. Did you, did you need to tell this to her mother? And she said no. Which, damn, that's disturbing to me. Wouldn't you want to know if your kid was hearing voices? You would want the, the doctor to tell you this. This is a problem. But one thing they did establish is is that medicine that she was on didn't create. It only made you want to self-harm. And which is which is bizarre too, by the way. And instead of harming somebody else. So I think they made grounds on that. But uh, as far as... Uh, I think the prosecution did very well. Establishing a whole bunch of stuff. She... Did she ever say she didn't remember stuff? Nope. Did she ever say she wanted to hurt herself or hurt somebody? Nope. None of this stuff. Did she hear voices? Nope. But she can only go by what she's saying. Here we go. Next witness. My name is Rebecca Kirk. I'm a licensed professional counselor. And Rebecca, where do you work as a licensed professional counselor? I'm an owner of a small practice called Magnolia Counseling in Madison, Mississippi. If you could tell us just a little bit about your uh, educational history. Um, I received my undergraduate degree in English education from Mississippi College and I taught um, some, t some prior and, some, and um, most of it simultaneously while I've been a licensed pro um, professional counselor. And then I received my, I, I taught uh, accelerated English mostly, so gifted students uh, chiefly, um, um, in the ninth grade at Madison, um, Rosa Scott for 14 years, um, and two years in Virginia. Um, and then I also received my master's degree in marriage and family therapy and individual counseling from RTS Jackson, which stands for Reformed Theological Seminary. And that consists of um, a very robust uh, master's degree program where we do 400 face-to-face uh, -face contact hours in clinic, uh, and then 600 uh, indirect supervision hours, and then postgraduate uh, degree. We uh, work and do uh, 3,000 more hours um, with the public under a uh, licensed supervisor before sitting to take the, um, the mental health uh, equivalent evaluation that the state requires for licensure. I also have to 
do 24 hours of continuing education classes uh, every two years to maintain that certification and licensure. And so, uh, is it safe to say that you are in fact licensed? I am. And you are back in March of this year too? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Rebecca, uh, it sounded like you have a lot of experience working with teenagers too. I do. Um, on, uh, did you have the opportunity to have um, a, a patient or a client by the name of Carly Gregg? Yes. Um, do you see Miss Gregg in the courtroom? Yes. Uh, same Miss Gregg that you provided services to? I did. Do you keep medical records uh, with regards to the sessions that you have with your patients? I do. May I approach the witness, Rebecca, I handed you what's previously been marked as State's Exhibit uh, S21. Actually, I think that's might be Defense, Defense Exhibit S, uh, D21, excuse me. Um, if you'll take a look at those for us. Okay. Um, do you recognize that, that document? I do. And what is that? These are my entire um, treatment notes and summary of um, counseling Carly Madison Gregg. And in some of those notes, Rebecca, um, when, when we got them, um, there were there was some writing like some handwritten stuff in that that's right uh, who did that okay so that uh, the the original intake form that she's referring to is um, completed by Ashley Smiley um, or was completed by Ashley Smiley and um, the last page um, concludes with questionnaires um, checking off like main, just main mental problems that a person might be experiencing. It also asks to list the goals for therapy. And um, the first session that I have with someone, uh, I go over the fact that since she's a minor, I need to speak with just that first session, um, one of the parental guardians, unless there is a need to contact them otherwise. I make that very clear. Um, to any minor and any adult that I see that confidentiality, and I do kind of want to say this, um, it's very important to mental health professionals to, sorry, to maintain confidentiality and to not really betray that trust. It's very important. And, um, I am doing that somewhat today um, from some people's perspective, but I'm not according to the Mississippi State Law because of um, when you declare reasons of insanity, I do have permission to discuss. She has given me permission to discuss her medical history. So um, confidentiality is important to me. And I make that extremely clear. I just probably, I just did then. Sorry for that. Um, that, I mean, I worked with, teen, I worked with teenagers um, for many years and so any um, mental health professional does say and has a duty to say that it is confidential under um, ex with the exclusion of just a few circumstances which would be if someone reports um, that they're going to harm themselves, um, if they know of a threat of harm to themselves or another, or if there's any physical abuse. And so I did meet with Ashley Smiley to answer your question um, for a portion of the first session. And so it's kind of confusing that last page. I want to explain it. Um, she completed it. She said that there were three goals. There are also questionnaires, you know, um, that are customary. Um, is it helpful for me to, to describe what's on this last page? Yeah, or sure, no? sure. You'll just tell us. Uh, let me take a step back. Sure. Um, if you would, what was, the, what was the date that this paperwork was filled out? This was her very first session with me, which I think was January 22nd. Does that sound right? Um, 2024. Your, your records reflect the first time you know that it was January. Yes, that's right. I see it here. Mm -hmm. So, if I, and I apologize, I interrupted you a little bit. Yes, if you'll just tell us sort of what this handwritten note reflects and kind of talk us through that first visit with Ashley and Carly. Okay, um, so the first uh, note that I have um, was completed, um, or the first set of goals on that last page of the intake form says um, by Ashley, she wants to feel better about herself. And secondly, another goal would be self-care management, internal thoughts. Um, so then I followed up and she also wrote Carly has been complaining of sleeping trouble and thoughts of depression, hopelessness, 
we discovered issues of cutting and taking old sleeping pills. Those issues have been removed and controlled, but also signify the possible level of depressive thoughts. So um, then I would continue to just question Ashley Smiley and, you know, um, wrote down on the same sheet some of the answers she gave me. And then I met with Carly the same session and added to some of um, that information on the same page that Carly, um, you know, based on talking to Carly. I want to talk to you kind of down at the bottom of that page, Rebecca, there's some things, um, it, it's kind of almost like a checklist. This is a, actually says checklist of current functioning. And then somebody has marked easily angered. Do you know, is that something that you would have done or that either Ashley or Carly did? Either Ashley or Carly. And I would assume it would have been Ashley. Um, but then I confirmed and went over it verbally with Carly as well. Um, so they both reported that she was easily angered. Yes. Um, it does say that she has intrusive or disturbing thoughts. Did y'all talk about what that meant? Yes. Um, just basically, I asked her, you know, the one of the biggest things that you do is you ask why now? Because a lot of times people do war with common stressors and then more severe ones and um, I wanted to know exactly why um, they were coming and she had Ashley had said that Carly had been cutting herself or she had found an old iPod and in that old iPod uh, she found out that Carly had been cutting herself for some time and she also described some dark thoughts and so I tried to kind of get to the bottom of what that was thinking that they were you know um, representative there by that check mark of has intrusive disrupting thoughts. And at some point they talk about uh, you have notes and it looks like they mentioned that Carly has trouble going to sleep at night. That's right. Um, and that seemed to be a big deal to her, the sleep issue. When you're treating a, a client, um, how important is it that you're getting accurate information from them? Extremely um, you know, again, that trust is so important. And so um, if you're not receiving the correct information, you can't see the whole picture. So you can't really treat the person um, in the appropriate ways, you know, tailored for them. We talked about Did, the nurse practitioner's testimony. Didn't they establish that she didn't have problems? She was sleeping fine. Did I miss something there? And then now with the therapist, she's having problems sleeping. She's having intrusive thoughts. It's a, it's different things that they're they're describing. Okay. About that you had a meeting with Ashley and that you met with Carly. Who knows Carly better than herself? Yeah. No one, right? Right. Um, so I, I want to ask you, Rebecca, on this first. Uh, meeting, did Carly ever report to you um, any use of illegal drugs? No. Uh, did she ever report to you that she was hearing voices of any sort? No. Damn. Did she ever report that she Here was we go. any sort of hallucinations? No. Damn. Um, what about, did she ever report to you that she was having memory trouble? No. What about feeling derealized? Did she or Ashley ever bring up the word disassociation? Mm -hmm. um, and, and to be clear, I want, I want to talk about the first day, but was there ever a time in your treatment of Carly that she reported that she was having any sort of blackout? Like there were times where she didn't remember what she'd done. No. So you, on the first visit, you kind of go through the current functioning and the checklist mm -hmm. uh, with Ashley and Carly. Mm -hmm. And then you actually provided um, some some chart notes from that uh, from that same meeting. That's right. Um, if you could, you, I think you talked about this that mom reported there was a burner phone. Mm -hmm. um, if you'll look down on on page two of your records, it says mom was upset. She lied, and when she asked about the relationship, is that something that Ashley conveyed to you that she was upset Carly was lying to her? Yes. Um, and then when you go down a little bit, there's a little bit of handwriting, and I think it says her bio dad. Correct. Uh, who wrote that in the records? I did. It was a grammatical, just edit for clarification. 
And to be clear, there's some other times in the right. records that when you produce these, you you went in and kind of wrote yeah. things. Yeah, because I want to be fully present, but I also want to take, you know, records of what's going on for my my need later to help her. Um, see, it says that she was four when her parents separated due to, and you put his and then her bio dad's pill, alcohol, and pot addiction. Um, it goes on to say he was getting high in front of her. Do you remember who told you that? Yes, um, both of them did. Uh, Ashley yeah. actually kind of broke down teary-eyed in the session, <laughs> um, which I inferred was what we all feel as parents, which we, you know, feel, am I the best parent? She felt a little bit, I read and then told her this is not your fault because she had discovered that he had been doing that for quite some time before Carly told her. Um, it may have been like a year and a half and I didn't get the impression the visits were often, but I mean, that's irrelevant. Um, she, when she went, said that he would be high constantly in front of her with drugs all around. And um, then when she did tell her mom, she stopped. And then they were in actually court, you know, um, discussion with trying to terminate his rights, I guess, um, permanently. And that was actually going on while she was seeing me. And so she's got these other things that Ashley's told you about, the sleep trouble and the things. But you also learned in, in meeting with them that there's a custody battle going on. Correct. What about your your note also says she was also taking sleeping pills because last month she hadn't been able to sleep and woke up at two and then it talks about now she's taking melatonin. So I, I want to be clear in your records it appears that the melatonin is not the sleeping pill. Correct. She was taking. In fact, it was my perception at the time that that was one of the things Ashley was upset about is that she was taking uh, sleeping pills. Um, did they ever tell you where she'd gotten those? No, I know nothing more than that. Sorry. Um, is there anything else that you recall um, specifically about that first interaction with Carly that we have not discussed? I just, the whole impression of working with her overall seemed to me to center on what was making her cut these dark, you know, nights of the soul, so to speak, when when she was um she reported having like existential thoughts about life and you know the meaning and things like that and so that's kind of what i flagged in my mind as a practitioner to try to to you know develop more of trust and um a <laughs> desire to go there to see what was troubling her and do you recall uh, you said you want to you kind of build rapport and trust with, with these people do you remember how many times you actually saw Carly between the first visit and your last visit with her? yes I saw her every week um, every work week once a week um, for a total of nine sessions which would have been nine hours not counting that time with Ashley so it would have been a little less that first session Oh, they were alone? The next time you saw Carly uh, in your records is from February the 2nd of 2024. Is that right? Yes. I want to talk to you. Um, it says persons in attendance patient. So can you describe, describe for us, excuse me, uh, what that means? Um, I am trying to see where you are. Can you tell me what page you're on? Yes, yeah, sorry. Page four of 24. Okay. Um, and then about uh, a little more than midway down on the bottom, it says persons in attendance. It yes, says patient. Patient, right. What she does that was, mean? She was the only one there um, from session two to session nine. I, I spoke and interacted with only her, with the exception of Ashley always brought her to her appointments. Um, I don't think her, I think that's an accurate statement. I think her stepdad did come with Ashley maybe like once or twice. I know like on Valentine's Day, for instance, they were together. Um, but he didn't ever come into the room? No, nobody ever. It was just the waiting room. So I would see them in the waiting room and you know, that was all. On that same page, Rebecca, you did, it looks like kind of an assessment of what you might do with a patient each time you meet with them. That's right. Um, could you tell us what you uh, observed of her behavior that day? Yes, it says appearance, normal grooming and hygiene, attitude calm and cooperative, behavior no unusual moments or psychomotor changes, speech, normal rate, tone, volume without pressure, affect, normal range, congruent, 
uh, thought process, goal directed and logical, perception, no hallucinations or delusions, orientation times three, so that's like you know where you are, um, like you know the time, you know, you can see where you are, hear where you are, those kinds of things. Um, memory concentration, short and long term intact, insight judgment good, mood stable and angry and sad. So she reported to you that she was angry. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to take kind of a couple of those one by one, Rebecca. Okay. Um, you talked about behavior, no unusual movements or psychomotor changes. Can you tell us what that means? Yes. Um, sometimes people are just very clearly on edge and they can't get to a calm place. And that's evidenced by a lot of movement in their chair um, or their body um, that's maybe not related to their emotional feeling. Um, of something they're describing necessarily, and then just like rapidity of speech, like very rapid, maybe loud speaking, things like that, maybe looking around a lot. And you didn't notice any of that? I did not right? notice any of that ever. Wow. And it says her thought process was goal-directed and logical. What does that mean? Um, she was able to carry on a conversation coherently without distraction, um, and that would have been okay if she was distracted, but um, she's very gifted and um, very, you know, good with her words, and um, we, we discuss things in a normal manner. You said perception, no hallucinations or delusions. What does that mean? Um, she was not reporting seeing or um, seeing anything that wasn't there um, or, you know, not being present with reality or anything of that sort. And what about her memory and concentration? What did, uh, what did you notice from that day in February uh, the 2nd? She, her short and long-term memory seemed fine to me. I want to talk to you about um, what your actual note says from that day in that visit. Um, it says she's frustrated that her friends don't take school as seriously as she and loses her patience. Tell us what you meant when you wrote that. She um, she was gifted, um, as you know, I think is a clear fact. Um, she really enjoyed school, and I taught her type of student for 14 years um, and so she had like an excitement to talk about school and um, she also I thought that probably one of the things she was dealing with that was difficult for her was possibly that um, sometimes when you're so gifted and different from others in any way it doesn't have to do with that uh, you might feel lonely and a little bit more isolated so um, I kind of attributed it mentally. I made a mental note that that was probably a relation there. But she was just describe the patience part. She was just described like being frustrated with peers who were not as quick as she, um, and that she knew she could be a little rude with them. Um, we also kind of talked about it's difficult when your mom maybe is a teacher too because you appreciate good teachers and know how hard they work. Um, so, and Rebecca, your notes say that she's regretful when she snaps at them and hurts their feelings. So Carly was reporting to you that she's like snapped at some of the kids at school. Yeah, and I did not get the impression it was in a violent way, but maybe like her temper. She she knew that that she was losing her patience with them. And later on, about midway, it says she gets angry at others sleeping through such good teaching. Yeah. That's kind of what you were talking mm -hmm. about, that she yeah. recognized she had good teachers. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you, Rebecca, about the next time that you saw Carly. I think you told us that you were seeing her pretty much weekly. Mm -hmm. um, the next record I have is from February the 9th of 2024. That's right. I um, want to talk to you uh, again about what you observed from Carly and what you put in your notes regarding her behavior. Okay. Um, you just want to know that. six, yeah. Of 20. Okay, the appearance and stuff? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I think, let me just look at it to make sure I'm not misspeaking. Uh, everything that I read a while ago, and I can read it again if the jury would like that, um, was normal, except uh, the only change I made was her appearance, I specified. 
um, her appearance was goth-like, wearing her grandmother's bat wing, black goth pants, and straight hair partly in her face. Oh my God, she um, just laughed about that. Everything else was in normal, and it's her behavior, mm -hmm. her speech, mm -hmm. her affect, her thought process, mm -hmm. the fact she was not having hallucinations that was or creepy. delusions. Correct. Her orientation to time, place, and what's the third one? I'm sorry. Um, time, Times three. Um, <laughs> time, place, and you're hearing, like, okay. just all of your five senses, okay. you're aware. Uh, and then memory and concentration, uh, short and long term, were intact. Yes, correct. Uh, and then you also have some treatment notes from that day. That's right. Um, I want to point you down to, it, it's toward the bottom of the paragraph. I mean, yeah, toward the bottom of the paragraph, it says, she has started cutting. If you would, can you read that sentence for me? Yes. Um... Looks like it's fourth up from yeah, the bottom. I'm sorry. I'm trying to, because I have an edit. I have a grammatical edit in there, and I'm trying to make sense of it. One second. Um, sorry for that. No, that's right. I just want. I didn't want to read it myself in case I was reading oh. it in the wrong place. Okay, she has cut, not currently, but in the past, when alone and in her head a lot. Uh, it was my understanding that what kind of prompted treatment with the psychiatric nurse practitioner, Olivia Lieber, um, was that she um, had found that iPod with this information about how she had been cutting and how she had some dark thoughts. Um, and I was trying to follow up, like I was saying a while ago, with like what was going on with you like in those times. And I think your note actually says, Rebecca, after some existential crisis moments of her atheism resulting in a lack of consciousness. Correct. Um, Can we break that down just a little bit? Um, sure. Those are some big words for me. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. Um, so... I never really could get her to open up about that very much. Um, I am, and I want to be clear, the atheism, that was something that I was kind of trying to think might be a possibility. She didn't, as I recall, really use that word. Um, but she did mention the word existentialism, and basically, in my opinion and training, I do think that's related to thoughts of what is the meaning of life. What's its purpose? Um, why are we here? Don't um, we all have that? And I could talk more on that maybe. That's but normal. Basically, she would get in a depressed state and cut. Um, and she described it as an existential crisis. And, but I couldn't really get her to describe a whole lot about that. She used the word existential. Yeah. I want to take okay. you to the next time you saw Carly, uh, Valentine's Day, February the 14th of 2024. <coughs> Um, and, and I apologize, Rebecca, I didn't ask this earlier. At the top of each of these notes, uh, you mentioned, like, whatever medication she's on. That's correct, time. yes. Um, are you and the nurse practitioner, Olivia Lieber, are y'all in contact about that, or is that relayed by the patient? Um, the psychiatric nurse practitioners or psychiatrists um, who <coughs> prescribe psychotropics, they oftentimes refer a patient and then unless there's a need um, like for an alarm you know situation, oftentimes we don't col collaborate unless needed. So no, I would be reporting what Carly told me about her med changes. Thank you. Okay. Oh, well wait, let's see because I was wondering if this would be a good stopping point. Is she? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, we talked about... Okay, so she's going to ask her another question. Wow! They've covered a lot! She didn't tell... Carly didn't tell her nothing. And she used the term existential? Okay, Carly was v valedictorian? <laughs> Carly <laughs> seemed gifted? She is good with words? This is all what the the prosecution's getting out of out of uh, this Rebecca lady who was the the uh, therapist counselor whatever you want to call her. I thought this was interesting is that uh, Carly would get irritated with her peers. Okay. This goes. This reflected back in my mind to. Her telling the doctor 
that the voice has told her she she's smarter than everybody. She's better. Well, better. I think I think he used the word better. Carly said the voice has told her she is better than everybody. Maybe the defense could come and go, well, remember when the doctor said this, said the, the voice has told her she's better than everybody, so it set a precedent for her to now with her peers because she's so damn smart. <laughs> she does so well at school. She's so good with words. And now now this, this lady's telling us that, that she got snippy and snooty or whatever how she wanted to say it snapped at at her friends because she's frustrated with her friends and this is part of her anxiety she has an anxiety that that she's irritated with her friends well to me that's kind of narcissistic damn blame of course a normal person you know you're smarter than somebody else a normal person's just gonna you know let it go move on we're all learn at different rates but Carly snippied at the other kids it gave her anxiety and how about when uh, when she said the only thing she noted different in that session is Carly's appearance Carly looked goth and she was wearing her grand grandma's whatever and then she quickly looked at her grandma and just smiled yeah I was wearing something of yours because I love you. It was creepy. I'm sorry, but that's, I think that was creepy. Well, so far, I think the, the, this is destroying the defense of the doctor. She ain't telling nobody nothing, and apparently, if I got this right, she was seeing Carly by herself. Carly was alone with her. Now, I just thought of this. Did Carly feel superior to these therapists? She Remember, she uh, the other one said, uh, the first doctor, uh, Olivia, in the notes that Carly wanted to stop the, the, the counseling, and I guess that's with this lady, I'm assuming. So... Why would Carly want to stop talking? I'm smarter and better than everybody. Now, are we going to say in her psychosis that she's smarter than her mother and her mother's a math teacher? She's smarter than everybody. She's smarter than her peers. She is stressed and has anxiety because her friends don't take school as seriously as she does. Which is an odd thing for a teenager to be upset about. I, she guys, she could be mental, but damn, did, when you were a teenager, did you give a shit? I mean, even if your buddy was like making bad grades, you'd be like, "Damn, dude, what are you doing, man? Why are you making bad grades? It's gonna make you look stupid." I mean, you'd say things like that, and you wouldn't be like all snippy at him. Like, why you ain't taking school? See, this is bizarre. To me, it is kind of weird. But yeah, bringing up uh, the voices that she heard when she was six, said she was better than everybody else. And then let's fast forward now that now she she's snippy with them because they're not uh, taking school serious and they're just not as smart as her. Again, I diagnosed her with being sociopathic. Uh, she has only empathy for herself and she's narcissistic, which we're seeing a pattern of narcissistic. She... <laughs> She's better than everybody else. I'm going to throw this out here. So somebody wrote in the chat, and I didn't see what the plea deal was. I just jumped into day one in the court trial, but let me know if I'm wrong. But I knew she got a plea deal, but I didn't know exactly what it was. <clears throat> they were going to offer her 40 years and, and parole her after 20. She should have took it. She should have took it. And that's kind of a shame that they're going to give her that kind of deal. Let's just say hypothetically she is has all this psychosis mental problems that the Dr. Clark, I guess his name is Andrew. I think it's Clark. Forgive me if I got his name wrong. But the doctor gave a list of crap that's wrong with her. 
and she's blacking out. She's hearing voices. No, she she doesn't need she doesn't need to be out. This could happen again. She's already acted upon it and killed somebody. Somebody that was close to her, her mother. What would stop her from killing a stranger? Well, there's no connection. There's a connection with her mother. Maybe that would have made it worse. I don't know. I am not a doctor. But there you have it. We're going to stop it here because this one's going long. And we're going to pick it up. The prosecution is still asking her questions. And I don't know how much longer it's going to go. So I'm going to start the next video. This is part one, day four of what they've went over. And I think when the defense came back up and... And this is the rebuttal, by the way. And when the defense came up to ask uh, Miss Olivia questions, I don't think they made any ground. Any ground whatsoever. I mean, yeah, they brought up, well, was her mom there? How many visits did you have? I think they should have probed, hit it more, where, and this is the defense. I know I'm not for Carly, but I'm just saying if I was... I'm not an attorney, but if I was, I'd be like, okay, so is that normal for a teenager to not be fully, boom, tell tell all to you? And no, they didn't. They didn't keep exploring that that avenue, and I think they should have because it could have scored points with the jury on her defense. And there you go. We're gonna wrap up day four, part one.